Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so I'm really excited to be hosting this panel on how corporates drive innovation in accessibility or embed um, accessibility into their innovative activities. Uh, so we've got a fantastic panel with us again this afternoon. Um, I have my colleague Adam Tweed who's co-hosting. Um, Adam's role ha involves uh, a, a lot of focus on innovation, so fantastic to have you here. You got here in the nick of time, Just didn't you? Please. Victim of the public transport system, <laughs> but he, he arrived triumphantly, so that is all fantastic. Uh, we also have the lovely Matthew from ThoughtWorks, David from Sony, we have Yuval from Access Israel and Rhiannon from the Valuable 500. So welcome everybody. How have you been enjoying the conference so far? All been going well? Great. It's so nice to be back together um, in Perton, isn't it? It's been amazing. Yeah. And this whole hybrid approach has worked so well because we've got 2,000 people signed up to join the virtual conference, but many of us have been able to get together for the in-person events, but also those in-person events have been uh, streamed to everybody yeah. else. So, uh, yeah, really, really, really yeah. enjoying it. Okay, so... Um, so if we just kind of go around the table a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, for everybody to introduce themselves to the audience and, and tell people a bit more about their organisation and what they're doing in, in terms of um, innovation. Um, I was going to actually go to you first, David. Uh, so obviously people probably do know of Sony, but I'm sure there's lots of things going on at the organisation that people aren't aware of. Um, and it'd be really good to get, I suppose, um, a bit of a download from you of what's been going on and how do you keep pushing innovation, but making sure that accessibility and inclusion is an integral part of that. That's great. Thanks, Amy, and thanks to TechShare for allowing me to speak today. Um, this is the fourth year that Sony's been a silver sponsor. We first sponsored in 2019. It's a great friend and event for us. We learn something every year. And as I go through my introduction, I'll touch upon a number of areas where I can highlight our type of learnings. If I can just self-introduce myself, I may a bald white male, round about 50, with a grey goatee beard. I'm wearing a blue suit. And for those who are hard of hearing, I've got a Welsh accent. A lovely accent. So Sony was founded in 1946 as a huge multinational, 100,000 employees. Uh, as people know, we design thousands of products, services, films, gaming, music. It's a very, very broad spectrum of activity. Um, we're across all countries, and we have very, very diverse cultures. So it's a real challenge when we talk about accessibility and disability inclusion, how to get those messages through the whole organisation. But we're quite fortunate, our, our head, Yoshida-san, he's recently been named, or he was named last year, as the Valuable 500, one of the 13 iconic leaders. Ooh. So Yoshida-san is buying into the accessibility mission we're on and disability inclusion. It's really raised up to the C-suite level now, where they set in targets and KPIs is being driven from the top and it's being challenged through the whole organization uh, to achieve good outcomes. Um, so we've got Sony Corporation. Within Sony Corporation, we have a team called the Accessibility Promotions Office. And this team of permanent members, they're trying to connect basically to all design teams, business groups, in country, regions, uh, and they're basically driving our policy and converting maybe external information into uh, information that can be digested within all the teams in Sony with the corporate policy. When Yoshida-san talks about our products and services, he always talks about kando. So kando is a Japanese word to feel moved emotionally. And it's a, it's a moment, so if you're using equipment or you're watching a film, you, you get that feeling, yeah, it's a kando moment is what they say in Japanese. And Yoshida-san's mission, he's requesting us to make sure that these candle moments can be delivered to everybody, regardless of ability. Um, we want to connect to everybody. So that's really a, the mission statement from the top down, is what Yoshida San's telling us to do. So again, a large multinational, we need to embed uh, accessibility, disability inclusion within the culture. If I look at then the European operation, we're quite lucky that recently, from April, we've kicked off a sustainability project of four pillars, corporate sustainability, uh, eco, um, 
diversity, equity, inclusion, and of course, accessibility. So our president in Sony Europe is uh, Furumi-san. He's basically now driving through the president's office. We're basically setting our KPIs and plans, and it's being driven from the top. So when I talk about executive buy-in, we've got executive buy-in from Rashida-san, and also within Europe, we get executive buy-in from Furumi-san. In previous TechShares events, we speak about Champions Networks. Um, a couple of years ago now, our Champions Network is running for two years. Initially, my ambition was to somehow drive the numbers high, but actually it's more about driving the quality of the people to make sure they connect across the organization. And just to mention, one of my roles is, I have a dual role. I have a 50% uh, I'm doing normal Sony work, the other 50% is accessibility. Um, and within the accessibility role, I'm, I'm one of the window persons for the APO team from Japan. So I have some regional responsibility in Europe to make sure that targets, plans are actioned and executed. Then I recognized that because some of the team were working part-time, we had the need for a permanent accessibility officer. And this is something listened to Ted last year. He explained that some of the guys are working part-time. And what I did want to happen is that our initiatives and efforts were being hampered by other priorities. Yeah. Then we have an accessibility promotion officer. Some of you might have met Joe on Monday in the House of Lords. Um, Joe's coming to us from UK government with three years experience in policy. So he's really complimentary to the team. It gives us extra bandwidth. So I can remember after the Texture event last year, um, I heard from uh, Sam Latif. She explained how she uses uh, simulation tools, such as glasses or gloves. One month later, I purchased, the, I purchased the, the glasses and they stayed under my desk for six months. But it was only when Joe joined the team, we've got the extra bandwidth, we can make these extra things happen. Um, under Furumi-san, every six months we have a, um, a Sony Europe uh, team meeting. It's a virtual meeting where all Sony Europe employees attend. Uh, the meeting was in September and I was able to speak for 10 minutes on accessibility to try to raise the importance, to give an introduction. Again, not, not all members understand about accessibility. I could raise the importance of it, um, the type of challenges being faced, but also what we're doing from a product perspective to try to overcome some of these challenges. And at the same time as that webcast, we also held our first empathy lab. So again, we, we finally got to use the glasses that Sam Latif recommended. We had a great event with about 60 people attending over two days. Uh, we're actually trying to make a YouTube video, and the video will be put externally so everybody can see what we did. Um, but the purpose of the video is basically to inform, educate, and engage. It was a huge amount of work to set up, and I think uh, through this event, we're always sharing information, and hopefully we can share what we did through the CAN network or through other networks, hopefully in future. Uh, but really, uh, if I look at the session yesterday from HSBC, they spoke about hearts and minds. Now, our training Sony, we've probably trained, I think, so far 50,000 people in accessibility training, and we've trained 25,000 in, in, um, in accessible design, Gosh. in inclusive design, sorry. Uh, so a huge amount of training, but I think we all know when we're doing training on PowerPoint, it doesn't always get absorbed. And what I felt is with the Empathy Lab experience, it's moving those hearts and minds. It gives you a deeper understanding and appreciation of the challenges being faced. So really the Empathy, Empathy Lab is really working for us. It was in Weybridge in September. We're going to take it to Stuttgart in, in December and off to London, Sweden in January. So we go to the sites where we have a lot of R&D members where they can hopefully take on these accessibility uh, challenges firsthand in early designs. If I can just touch lastly then about some collaborations we've done. So I think, um, but whenever I'm talking about creating teams, we always try to play to people's strengths. Yeah. If you want to do things quickly, sometimes it's not always good to do it yourself. So today in, um, in the session with Mike Somerset, he explained about the link buds with the open ring design, these are the headphones, but also a gyroscope feature. And these are perfectly paired with Microsoft Soundscapes and also Niantic artificial reality type games. Next, sorry, I have to get my bag out now. <laughs> Your bag of tricks. My bag is finally here. Them. So this camera will be explained tomorrow. We've got a session on photography in our third uh, Lunch and Learn. And this is basically a collaboration with a company called QD Laser in Japan. So it's a Sony camera HX99, and you can see this QD laser attachment. It's basically a retis viewer. So it projects the image by a low power safe laser into the back of the eye. So if you have problems in the front of the eye, in terms of focusing or cataract or something, it should image directly on the back of the retina. How cool so is that? I'm not a technical expert for this technology. Um, we'll have an explanation tomorrow from the experts. He'll explain exactly about the technology. But again, this is a, a second collaboration where Sony's working with experts in the field to try to bring this proof of concept through to products quite quickly. 
Next, Sony's also uh, announced recently a partnership with, w with WS Audiology. These are Huronade experts in Denmark. Right. And recently, Sony's launched Huronades over the counter in America. So these are hearing aids that you can set up on a mobile phone. You don't need a medical prescription. They're quite affordable. And so only trying to tackle the market where maybe there's a, a stigma or people don't want to put a hearing aid in. These hearing aids look like a link bud. It looks mm. like a regular headphone. Um, but the hearing aids really, it's hopefully going to open up. If we look at WHO information, there's an epidemic come in. And through the use of maybe uh, high volume equipment in the past, there's going to be a generation coming through who are really going to suffer. So Sony's trying to address that um, by doing something for the over-the-counter headphone market. Only two more collaborations to go. <laughs> the next one is Kaleidoscope. So after Tech Share in 2020, I met through a mutual contact, a wonderful gentleman called Hardy Bry. So we had a number of conversations. Tech Share was in November, then Hardy joined us in December, I think it was the International Day of Disabilities, and Hardy was a guest speaker. We had about 60 people from Sony who attending, and Hardy really moved us. We talked about hearts and minds. Hardy right. explained the story, the background as to why he left his investment banking job and why he established Kaleidoscope, really move in. So we start that relationship with Hardy, and somehow I wanted to give something back. And if I look at how, what Hardy was doing and where Sony's strengths are, we have we have within Sony, we have a startup acceleration program team based in Sweden. Hardy has disabilities or entrepreneurs with disabilities. Then we put them both together and there's been some great collaboration taking place where our SSAP team in Lund are able to collaborate with Hardeep's team to try to uh, improve their proposals, their outcomes. Hopefully, we're working with the blue chip, they give different insights and confidence. But that's what we've we'll be, been doing with Kaleidoscope and hopefully we can take that relationship to a next level and better outcomes. And last but not least, it's not just about the products, it's also about the service. And we announced, I think, on the 13th of October, World Sight Day, we announced that Sony is now partnered with Be My Eyes. Oh, brilliant. So we are providing support for electronic products in Europe across seven countries and seven languages. Um, so somebody using the Be My Eyes app will go directly through to a Sony expert if it's television expert, if it's mobile phone, whatever, you go through the television expert. I think what's important, again, Sony being a big corporation, we could have created our own system for this sort of communication, but Be My Eyes existing, then to ride on the back of the same ecosystem and to make it a one-stop shop, it really makes sense. And I just want to make a call out to Hans-Jorgen Weberg. Um, he worked very, very well with our, our service support team. A big call out to him. It was a pleasure for our team working with the Be My Eyes team. And that, that collaboration, I think, is going to grow. I mentioned seven countries, seven languages. Watch your space. Europe's a big country. And we've got some way to go. But that's just a bit about what we, what we do in Sony. Uh, just just a, a brief introduction. I was going to say it's a dizzying introduction with so much to go at, isn't there? Um, I, I tell you what my big takeaway from what you've just told us is it's that whole that collaborative approach I think is absolutely key. You mentioned speed and also engaging the experts rather than reinventing the wheel. But also doesn't that all feed into that can Kando moments? Can is that what you call Kando? It, it Kando. does, yes. It's, it's, to be, it's to be moved emotionally. Yeah, yeah so. and, and that is go you're going to hit that spot so well by taking that approach, aren't you? Um, I think also the other thing that struck me is you said you've got this very, very senior by and Yoshida San is, is, you know, he's driving that from the top and, and a lot of the people that we talk to at conferences like this are initially saying we're all started at the ground level. We've been the ones banging on the doors, you know, we've been the ones trying to get our voices heard and now there is that buy-in from the top and it's, it's where those two are going to gradually meet that we're going to get fully accessible organisations. Obviously, uh, Yoshida San's located in Tokyo with Furumi Sands, the President's Office in Europe, we have monthly accountability meetings. Fantastic. So we set our plans, you have to deliver. Mm. But it also gives a great opportunity now, when we talk about budgets in FY23, it gives me a whole new opportunity yeah. to make proposals which can be funded um, at the corporate level. In the Fantastic. past, the funding we do comes from our television business group up until now, but now through this sustainability project, it means we can also try to increase capacity and get better outcomes. Yeah, that senior leadership, it just opens the doors for the rocket to fly through, doesn't it? You know, and, and I love that 
uh, term accountability meetings because immediately when you're walking into one of those, you're uh, on your toes, aren't you? You know, you're there. You need to have your updates. I bet you <laughs> do. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, David. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's various questions in the chat for you about all of those sure. projects that we can pick up afterwards. Uh, Matthew. Hi, hello. Tell us about, because um, I know you've got some personal insights of innovation yeah. and then also, um, you know, around ThoughtWorks and so on. So, yeah. Yeah. So, in. first of all, I'd like to describe myself a little bit. So, I have brown hair um, and I have a green top. Um, I think that's probably a good explanation, brown height. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm Matthew and I am profoundly deaf. And I need to wear, I've always worn hearing aid. Well, first of all, I want to talk about it from a personal experience, and then I talk about um, thought work. But I really want to talk about my personal experience because it's really important. Um, so I'm for Provaldi Deaf, this birth, and I've always worn hearing aid till about 10 years ago, I have a cochlear plant. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, but I think it's important that I explain what it really means because I've spoken to a few people and they don't really understand what a cochlear mm. plant did. So a cochlear plant did, it had a wire, they, they drilled a hole in my skull and then they put a wire inside into the cochlear. So it bypassed all these, um, whatever in there, and then they put the wire in, inside the cochlear, which is a type of P. And on the wire there are 22 electrodes. Um, and each electro emit different type of frequency. And um, it means that my nithany had improved by 50%, which means I'm here so much more and I'm able to do, the, do more, my company grow, and so on. Um, but not just only that, it also had a, a Bluetooth, it Bluetooth enabled, cool. which means I could connect to any Bluetooth device. And therefore, the, the, uh, the sound is much more clear. There's a lot of clarity, OK? So together with caption, live caption, which obviously I live and breathe with caption, together with Bluetooth, it's a really uh, a big game changer. Uh, especially, I have the Google phone. Um, and, you know, two years ago, the, the, the Google phone, when, allow me to make call because they translate the speech to text and it's really accurate. And before that, for 55 years, I'm really my age now. Oh, you don't um, 55. <laughs> <laughs> I am not really able to use the phone except, you know, tech method. But two years ago, I would able to use the phone. And now I need the phone every day every day, like everybody else. And that's what inclusivity means. And that's what innovation means. It's tech, it's an enabler. So it gave me that independent. Um, and together with Bluetooth, it's just amazing. So that's my personal, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. And that's why I believe tech is the way forward to give the neighbor people that independent uh, you know, and freedom. So I work for Fort Work, and who are we? We are a global uh, tech consultancy. So obviously we work with our client. Um, and this year I had a new role, and I'm the global head of disability inclusion. This year I made sure that every region, we have 14 countries at the moment, that they have... Um, a work environment for people with disability that they can thrive and able to perform, be productive. Brilliant. Not just at thought work, but also at our client. Mm. So that was this year. But next year, because accessibility, um, it, it's so great because accessibility drives innovation. And people love innovation. You have to think outside the box. You know, if you want to make your product inclusive, you should have to think out of the box. And therefore, it made ThoughtWork quite attractive for people who want to work for us. But not just that. Client will want to come up and say, you know what, I want you to help us to think about how we can make our digital product innovative. And we want to have that conversation. Um, so we have that 
opportunity to encourage our client, Nick, make your product more inclusive. And that's what I want to do next year. So I've been creating a um, training pathway for okay. each role. You know, not a generic one, but for each role, a product, project, developer, and so on. But also, how we test our product. Obviously, we need tech with real people with disability, not just an assumption, oh, I will wear a blindfold and I pretend to be blind and test it, or I wear earmuff, or something like that. You need to tech with people with disability. And not say, oh, Matthew, um, we need someone to tech with caption. Can you help her? No. I want you to contact a third party. We'd had a need to group. They are paid. They should be paid. Mm. Can't get a real contact a need to group. I know they're a couple. And thought work, we are working with a couple of need to group, and we will pay them to test our product on an iteration. They are the important bit, and that that what my um, patching do. Sounds really exciting, doesn't it? I was going to say, the, the fact that you were talking there about people coming to you and saying, how do you make our products more accessible? I think that the reframing of that is, how do you make our products reach even more people? Yes. How can you make our products so that they are now going to be reaching everybody, increase, you know, increase profit, increase, yeah, they're a better product for everybody. Exactly. So, yeah. And, you know, obviously, they need metric. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's a nice thing to have. But if you provide the metric, for example, we have the purple dollar yeah. at the moment, 13 trillion. Mm -hmm. I mean, 13 trillion dollars per year. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's a, it's a significant amount, but also brand awareness, uh, we retain customer, and so on. Yeah. Um, so you do have to talk about metric. Yeah. I also think the thing that you were talking about with the transcription um, apps. It has, for me, been a really interesting arms race, if you like, between the leaders in the space to see who can do it better, who can include more. Google's fantastic in that it can do the um, ambient sounds, so the sound of breaking glass or a, a baby crying and that sort of thing. You can, you can reaching more and more people because people are saying, well, hang on, if we're, if we're deciphering speech, then we can just pop in. There's that little bit. and. Yeah, it improves and it improves, and then there's that competition, and yeah, it's you know, and competition. talk about accessibility. When you, I mean, when the mobile phone came out, um, wonderful, but obviously the deaf people couldn't use it. Mm. But a group of deaf people created the SMS. Yeah. Now everybody knew it. It, it involved your WhatsApp, you know, all the yeah. chat group, and a blind person who worked for Apple created the voice recognition. Everybody knew it. Mm. So you support it for the people who really need it. It benefits be for all. Yeah, definitely. And that's where I think your how your role's focus is evolving of creating the best conditions for diverse employees, and then building on that to take it to the client base. Your team are so much better equipped to be able to deliver that, aren't they, you know? And it's really uh, authentic and kind of uh, couched in experience, which is just fantastic. So, Rhiannon, welcome. Your, uh, your organization's name cropped up when David was talking. So the Valuable 500, uh, what a journey that's been. And I know we've heard from Caroline <laughs> earlier, but um, for anyone who perhaps doesn't know about the Valuable 500 or didn't catch that session, if you could just give us a, a quick introduction to the organisation, but also importantly to your role, because that is focused on innovation and how does that all fit together with, with the membership? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's just such a pleasure to enjoy or to join in on discourse that is is so centric on tech and innovation, and I, I absolutely love that. So, um, yes, I sit as chief innovation officer, and the Valuable Five Hundred is really, you know, best described as a CEO-led community of five hundred global companies committed to driving change and really committed to ending disability exclusion. Um, so, we've heard a couple of really key themes on the panel today. You you know, talking about the importance of, I think, first and foremost, breaking the C-suite silence on disability, you know, so getting our leaders talking about it, caring about it, um, and, and really kind of 
bringing them in close proximity to it, driving their teams and their businesses towards better. So that that's a big part of what we do. And the way that our CEOs articulate this commitment to uh, disability inclusion and the work that they're doing is through commitment statements and really tangible actions that they um, have committed to on behalf of their businesses. So it's really important, I think, that each company has the autonomy over what that looks like. We see a wide um, kind of spectrum of things that they've committed to, but also a lot of synergies. Um, and so, yeah, in the role of, uh, I think a lot of people want to know what does that uh, that role consist of, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, so, obviously, I oversee our innovation strategy within the Valuable 500. And, you know, we're doing some really exciting things using AI and automation to understand our 500 companies, really to take a 360 degree view of them and the work that they're doing and kind of their their place in the corporate landscape um, but also yeah we need systems and processes to advance our mission and do the work that we're doing um, the second kind of bucket of of my work and what I, I think I love doing the most is convening innovation within the 500 so bringing companies together um, catalyzing discussions that help the companies um, get from point A to point B a lot faster because you see um, maybe in distance disparate areas of the network, people doing incredible things that others are not aware of. So we want to really avoid duplicate effort and investment and resource uh, resources being used and help them come together towards collective and sustained action. Um, and kind of the third bucket of my work is, is really looking at radical innovation. So what is coming out of, um, and oftentimes this is coming from disabled entrepreneurs, um, you know, businesses doing incredible things to drive the work forward. I love all those buckets, do you? Well, it made me think, um, I was listening to a podcast recently around innovation, and one of the analogies that they used is having a bucket of Lego. Uh, and you can yeah. only go so far with that bucket. You can build so many things, you can do so many things. When you invite somebody else in and they've got their own bucket, suddenly you've got two buckets full of Lego and your options increase exponentially. So, that yeah, convening. That made me yeah. feel a bit tingly actually I was just thinking yeah. some of those sessions because I read something a little while back that said innovation nowadays is almost exclusively done by the bringing together of two existing things yeah. rather than mm. creating one new thing and therefore it requires by definition collective input and David you've mentioned it Rhiannon you've mentioned mm. it I you know at ThoughtWorks you're working with the customers bringing that outside insight mm. and um and also the just, term radical oh, innovation um, you know bringing those so you've got within your your uh, activities Rianne, and these CEOs and large corporates but you're injecting these uh, kind of um, uh, yeah uh, startup innovators if you like who come fresh yeah. to, to, the, to the party don't they new ideas fresh mm -hmm. ideas yeah different ways of thinking Amazing. I was thinking there's a construct in psychology called functional fixedness, right? So it's what that refers to is like, you know, you look at something, you look at a box of matches, there's an assumption about how it's supposed to be used, right? So that box of Lego, I might have an assumption about how that piece is to be used or how I can connect it. And I'm just stuck yep. on that, right? So that's when you bring the others in and it's like, hey, this piece could actually be used to do something else. So that's where we see. And oftentimes uh, the disabled community and, you know, employees with disabilities are the best at bringing those, those different perspectives because of um, kind of the day-to-day -day requirements yeah. for being adaptable and resilient and all those things. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I think kind of to that point, um, it's about this, there is a, a, a thing with human beings as well. When we, when we find a solution to the problem, there is a tendency for us to stop thinking about that and then fixate on making that solution work. And actually by bringing in new voices, bringing in new ways of thinking about things, you're gonna have those challenges and that's where innovation comes from. From that challenge from saying, well, okay, you've come up with one idea, Let's put that to one side. That's a possible solution. Let's look at something else. Let's look at something else. Let's keep going until we find an even better solution. Or we go back to our original and go, no, that turns out that was the right one. <laughs> I think the best thing is to create the customer journey. Yes. 
and identify where the pain points are. Yes. That what you should really start, and then. Then go you can go rifling through the Lego to yes. find the right piece, can't you? Yes. Yuval, welcome. Dialing in from Israel, are you at, at home at the moment? Yes. Uh, it's great to be with you all. Oh, it's and lovely. as always, Tech Share Pro is super interesting and innovative by itself. And uh, pleasure to be with you. So you've been working in this field for many years and you've been involved in a huge amount of different innovations. Um, so from your... From your experience, what, what are the keys for large corporates trying to inject accessibility in the heart of, of their innovation? Yeah, uh, Access Israel was founded in 1999. And since then, we're promoting accessibility for all kinds of disabilities in all areas of lives. And one expertise, of course, is uh, implementing accessibility to corporates, businesses. And as you all know, accessibility is something that is developing for many, many years ago, where it started at the built environment, and then it went to culture accessibility, that we are not disabled, we are people with disabilities, we are not crippled, we are not handicapped, we have people with disabilities, and then it went to another stage where we call it accessibility of services. And later on, it developed to digital accessibility, mainly website accessibility. And now we're talking about widening it. Also, we went to the next stage of inclusion and employment of people with disabilities. And we are now an, at an amazing uh, stage where we're looking forward into two main very interesting areas, uh, when we can call it innovative areas. One is inclusive products, and David was, was talking about a few amazing examples, but companies that have products are trying to have their products fully accessible and fully inclusive, and that is an amazing trend that is in the beginning of it. And the second uh, uh, amazing area that we are focusing on is even more future about our future tech era lives, where we're talking about autonomous transportation and robots and, 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 and uh, many other technologies that will be part of our lives in the future. And we, 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 and we want to make sure those technologies and services based on technologies for the first time in the in the development of accessibility will be accessible by design. Mm. The biggest innovating change we have to make is because right now what what the paradigm is people are doing services or developing products and they are not accessible. Most of them are not accessible, that's the truth. And we have to change that and to make sure that everything new will always be accessible and inclusive by design. So what I believe in from our experience, and we are great friends here with Vianian and the Dango 500, which this initiative is about something that is amazing because what, what they're doing is you talked about before about implementing accessibility from button up or from the C suite and down from the manager down. And I tell you that I believe from top down, you have to engage to the CEO or the chair and make sure they don't only understand what we talk about when we talk about what the word accessibility and inclusivity, what it means, they have to believe in it. Mm -hmm. Only when they believe in it, 
and they understand why it's good for their business. Not just to say, okay, we are very uh, social responsibility mm. is great. Caroline talks about it a lot. Caroline from Bible 500. They actually have to believe they're doing it, first of all, for their business, but also, of course, they have a lot of added values for the society and, for, and other, other advantages. But when they make the decision, the next stage is what we have in Israel, we have a model of implementation of how to make a large corporate fully accessible. And the word fully accessible means that everything is accessible. The, the, building, the buildings and the offices and the training of the, of the employees. And of course, the digital and all the services and all the products and all the procedures and all the departments, all the organization have a DNA of accessibility. When you do that, when you get all the way deep down, that all the organization lives accessibility. Everything is done by design, but it's all already in the DNA, it's by procedures the organization, then it's not only being accessible, it's also enable that the organization to maintain to longer term the accessibility, but also go to the next step of excellence, mm. of doing unique things, of developing new things, of working with the community, with the, with the target market, with people with disabilities, with your clients together to, to hear them, to hear what, what you can improve in our organization and engage with them, not being afraid of that. And so actually, we are in super exciting times. Uh, in Israel, we are more and more dealing on one hand on still implementation and having more corporates fully accessible and, and again, getting to the next stage. On the other hand, we are in the last 10 years are very involved internationally. We're also working with corporates around the world, with organizations around the world, and also we're proud to be great friends with Valuable 500. And we all, what we say, we both learn, but we also are able to share from our experience to other corporates and governments and municipalities, how to do it right. And when you do it in a systematic way, and in our way, it's our access Israel model of how to do it, it's actually, you can do it more quickly, more efficiently, more professionally. You do it the right way. Because I hear of many organizations that have hundreds of accessibility people in the organization. Everyone is doing great stuff, but it's not a method that is getting them into the target of being a full accessible corporate. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the end of the day, if you reach this target, you at the stage that we call it the win-win-win situation. So that's our share of innovation, convince the managers that this is the right thing for them, do everything you can do to convince it. But why do you, if you success on that, and this is what the Valuable 500 is doing, convincing the Valuable 500, and if they are convinced, they can jump into the pool and start working, doing it in a, met a methodical way, and I'm sure this is, uh, can be done in a way of efficiency. And at the end of the day, let's not forget something very important. It's good for the companies, but we do it for people with disabilities yeah. and the elderly yeah. that need it. And this is very important to remember that because we talk about ourselves all the time, what we do and what, but we do it. And, and uh, David again says something great about the Be My Eyes. Okay, at the end of the day, 
when something is being done right, you can measure it. You can see how many people use it. Yeah. And you can actually come back and okay, we invested all this effort in implementing accessibility and efforts and the resources and money. It, it's it's a big thing. It's not a, you know, you, you have to, <laughs> everyone that implements it know how, how expensive it is. But at the end of the day, you, we want to show that it was worthwhile. Again, both for profit, but also for social responsibility. So uh, good luck, and we always love to share and work together with partners, so feel free to contact. Definitely. No, you've made so many points there that really resonate. Mm. Was there something you'd picked there was up just there, something that I was going to say that, that I, I think was kind of covered, but I, I think it's also about employment. It's about equal employment opportunities. It's about getting disabled people into roles, and it's making sure that there aren't barriers for promotion within that. So yeah. it's all very well having uh, a non-disabled C-suite level manager saying to people, yes, we need to promote accessibility. But if you've got a person with lived experience of disability, in those senior roles, that's going to make it even more powerful. Mm. That's going to connect hearts and minds. That's going to be that powerful message that you need as well. Yeah, it's a huge game changer, isn't mm. it? I can't believe that we are getting to the end of this panel discussion already. Um, so, I, yeah, I've just sort of put in together, so especially um, you, Val, some of the things you were saying about the senior leader who that that element has been a, a key theme through this discussion and it is as you said Yuval that belief that genuine drive from that person at the top of the organization to deliver that experience and and then um, something that I've always found with leaders that I've worked with that have inspired me is the ability to convey that message in a really straightforward way so that they can take all their people with them um, and I think that is you know um, just very very good at creating the momentum and I think with the valuable 500 one of the things I love about your membership is rather than people signing up to a generic commitment they've all made their own individual and very detailed i mean they're varying levels of detail aren't there but they're very specific and again as a team member in that organization assuming that those leaders pick up that commitment and talk about it day in day out it becomes their commitment too it's and you make that, that so sweet you need to practice what you preach. Yes, 100%. So I want thought work. I mean, it doesn't have to be thought work. It could be anybody. But you need to make your company an attractive place for people with disability. And that means making your working environment uh, inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that way, also, as you say, provide a leadership pathway for them to grow and to take leadership role. Mm -hmm. If you show that what you do, then you can demonstrate and you can um, educate. Yeah. Well, we are our customer, our client. Look, this is what we're doing, and it it's working. I agree. So the next challenge is 500 disabled CEOs, Rhiannon, committing. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. So I, I'm just going to say thank you so much to everybody for your input today i think um you know we've got loads of takeaways here of how you can drive innovation in large corporates and actually those principles that came up equally apply to small and medium-sized organizations so uh yeah lots for everyone to think about thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you for having me thank you thank you